Last week, I talked about how the integral extended to scalar fields. The integral became a way to measure volume or hypervolume under the graph of a function. It was calculated as an iterated integral. Calculated with iterated integrals is actually a pretty involved subject. I'm going to spend both this and the next week on various aspects of integral calculation. Let me start with a couple of small observations in this video before moving on to more substantial topics in the next. To start with, I want to extend improper integrals. An integral is improper in two ways, or can be improper in two ways. When the function has an asymptote at the edge of the domain, or when the function itself, or when the domain itself extends to infinity. And I'll deal with these in turn. For a single variable integral, an asymptote at the edge of the domain happened at the start or the end of the interval. For multivariable functions, the interval now has a much more complicated boundary. Say the function is defined on the square 0 to 1 cross 0 to 1, not including the axes. The function could diverge to infinity all along the edge x equals 0, along a whole side of a square. How does the integral handle this? Well, in an iterated integral, I can actually use the single variable approach to improper integrals, limits approaching the edge of the domain. The limit a goes to zero from the positive side does cover the entire x equals zero edge of the square, domain, square domain. This works. Similarly, if there is an asymptote on the y equals zero edge of the square, I can take a limit a approaches zero from the positive side for the y integral. Notice that this limit can be either on the inside or on the outside integral. This iterated integral setup does allow me to manage infinite behavior at the edge of the domain by using limits. This square is but an example, but the general technique holds. By using a limit in either the inside or outside integral, I can manage behavior at the edge of the inter interval. These are improper integrals, which means they may or may not converge. The limits may or may not exist. Since these are now measuring volumes or hypervolumes under the graphs, the limits are determining whether the volume or hypervolume under the graph is finite or infinite. If the limit diverges to infinity, it means that the graph covers an infinite volume or hypervolume. That covers the asymptotes of the function, edges of the domain where the function diverges to infinity. I also want to potentially integrate over infinite domains. To take an example, Maybe I want to integrate over all of R2 as a domain to ask for the volume under the graph of F over the whole Cartesian plane. This also requires a limit. There are a variety of ways to set them, this limit up, and one of them is to take the interval from negative A to A cross negative B to B, which is a rectangle centered at the origin. Um, and then I can take the limit in both variables as the edges of this rectangle go to infinity. In the limit, this extends the domain of the integral to the entire plane. If both limits exist, then the improper integral converges and the volume under this graph, even over the whole plane, is finite. This limit can be done in two steps, one for the inside and one for the outside integral. The limit of the y range can go inside the x integral. This chain, this, <laughs> this change of order Integrals and limits when the variable makes sense is, a, is an important technique to make note of. There's a long history of formal mathematics that justifies these kind of operations, moving limits, derivatives, and integrals in front and behind each other to aid calculation. I'm not going to go into those details in this course, but I thought I should make you aware that a more formal treatment of multivariable calculus would make the efforts to justify these statements, that I'm allowed to move a limit inside or outside an integral, and to prove that these manipulations are valid. Again, this is just an example, but the general idea holds. Over domains which are infinite in one or both variables, limits can allow the integral to be defined over finite intervals and then extend the bounds of the intervals to infinity. Here's an example. This is over the square, not counting x equals 0 and y equals 0. If both x and y are 0, this function does have a division by 0, so it is undefined at the point 0, 0. This function has an asymptote at 0, 0, so let me use a limit to approach the undefined point. 
I set up the iterated integral with x inside and y outside. Then I do the inside integral. For the inside integral, I don't yet need a limit. With x squared plus y squared in the denominator, this is not yet zero when x equals zero because I haven't set y yet. When these partial integrals treat y as a constant, they can delay the problematic values of y until the next step. So this inside integral is not improper, it's ordinary. I asked the computer for the antiderivative and got x over y squared root x squared plus y squared, and I evaluate on this boundary to get an interval, an integral in y. Now this integral in y is improper. It is undefined at one end of its domain. So I use a limit. Again, I asked the computer for the antiderivative and evaluate it on the endpoint at y equals 1. I get negative root 2 over 1. For the other piece, I evaluate at a and take the limit. In this case, the numerator approaches 1 and the denominator approaches 0 from the positive side, so the limit is positive infinity, and I conclude that the improper integral diverges, and the graph of this function covers an infinite amount of volume as it gets larger and larger up to the asymptote at 0, 0. Now let me move on to the second little observation for this video. Sometimes it happens that a function of two variables is the product of two single variable functions f equals g times h. In this case, the iterated integral has a particularly nice form. Let me set up the integral over some interval a to b times c to d. In this iterated integral with the y variables inside, the function g of x is a constant as far as the y integral is concerned. Therefore, by linearity, I can pull it out of the integral. Then I have an integral of h of y in the variable y with no x's involved at all. But as far as x is concerned, this whole thing is also a constant, so I can pull that whole thing out of the x integral. The result is a product of two single variable integrals, one for each of the two pieces of the function. The integrals separate, hence the name of separable functions for functions of this type. It's pretty useful to recognize this, since it makes the integration more efficient. This might seem like a slightly strange special case to point out, but many functions fit this mold. More than that, separable functions show up as exemplars in many techniques and form the basis for complicated solutions in differential equations. Finally, this pattern holds, of course, for more variables. A three-variable function is separable if it is the product of three pieces, each in an individual variable, and likewise on to higher dimensions.